Hey everyone, how are you? Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, welcome for the first time. Today, we'll be going over another interview that Connecticut Valley Views published on YouTube called Challenging the Rainbow Mafia. Immediately, just from the title, we are off to a bad start based on what the stakes are in this year's presidential election. It's not just because the next administration will decide if Ukraine will continue to receive aid in its fight against Russia and the United States retained its membership with NATO. The results will additionally determine the education school-aged children receive, if same-sex marriage will still be recognized, or whether or not essential medical care such as abortions and services to assist transgender individuals will remain protected by law. The United States of America, under Republican leadership, is looking more and more Aurelian with each new law restricting the instruction of gender identity and its history approved. Without critical race theory, students would not know why Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat anymore, nor would they know why Japanese Americans were sent to live in internment camps during World War II. Often we are taught to never judge a book by its cover, but it is a rare occurrence where the cover paints a concise picture of why this video is injurious and disturbing and that's putting it politely. Before I play the interview and dissect it, I want to have a look around to get a sense of why that is the case. If you don't know what the Rainbow Mafia is, basically it's a pejorative phrase used by the Republican Party to describe the LGBT plus community in conspiracy theories that claim they've taken over the mainstream media and is using it to influence children to come out as gay or transgender. I briefly browsed the search results when I looked up the phrase on Instagram and I found this horrifying caption a therapist posted about her experience participating in a rally that Gays Against Groomers had organized. Queer individuals joining the fight against child exploitation is terrific to read about in hindsight, but that's not what's happening here. The Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center has identified Gays Against Groomers as an extremist group for its promotion of the conspiracies that have made it tougher for the LGBT plus community to be seen as human. Gays Against Groomers has gotten in regular trouble on social media sites for violating their hate speech policies. They were previously suspended from Instagram and Facebook, but continue to maintain a presence on these platforms despite Meta's comments to the Daily Dot that equating the LGBT plus community with child grooming and accusing them as such without a leg to stand on goes against their terms of service. If it were up to me, I would let this suspension stand because of how widespread these conspiracies have gotten thanks to posts from this therapist endorsing that group. Meta's hate speech policy should be more strictly enforced right about now. I emphasize that focusing exclusively on a kid's gender identity won't completely solve any related mental conditions they're dealing with, but it is one that should be dealt with sooner rather than later. Gender affirming care may not prevent suicide, but it reduces the likelihood that a trans kid receiving that care would take their own lives. I previously talked about a similar incident that transpired outside of Moms for Liberty Forum in Avon where Susan Regan attempted to communicate with protesters opposed to the event, only to be chastised when she approached them. On Saturday, October 21st, 2023, Connecticut Valley Views attended a Moms for Liberty Forum being held at the Avon Connecticut Senior Center. What greeted host Susan Regan and executive producer and photographer Bill Regan was a throng of protesters who called the forum attendees terrorists and fascists. The word terrorist is defined as a person who uses unlawful violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. A significant police presence was evident on the premises. Inside the well-attended senior center, Manju Gerber, president of Moms for Liberty of Hartford County, led the forum. MFL is a group of parents seeking to realign the education system to support their values. The event included guest speaker, James Stephen Lindsay, an American author and cultural critic. A panel discussion followed. As CTVV exited the senior center during a forum break and attempted to encourage free speech responses from the protesters, they were met with assault of language and unresponsive dialogue. Thus, CTVV was unable to obtain any comprehensible sound bites. CTVV left the premises as it appeared that the crowd was trying to escalate their rhetoric 
to a more contemporary. From their perspective, Susan was correctly perceived to be endorsing the organization's mission to erase subject matter from the curriculum in public schools that could save lives, and to be honest, I don't blame them. She could have gotten that chance to talk to the protesters by abstaining from attending the forum, but she blew it. So much for insight without bias. Likewise, the therapist that wrote this harmful post ruined her credibility by approaching the counter-protesters when they quickly understood who she was with. You cannot sport a hoodie with a slogan, no kid is born in the wrong body, on the back and not expect onlookers to look at you as an insensitive busybody that claims you want what's best for kids because you don't. Telling a trans kid that they're beautiful the way they are to discourage them from transitioning is comparable to giving them the death penalty. The Williams Institute in LA published a study over a year ago that found that over 40% of transgender adults in the US have attempted suicide and unless public schools are left alone, the children the therapist wants about advocating for could grow up to believe they don't deserve humanity. She states that slogans and platitudes barely scratch the surface of how complex people are when she has posted photos of herself and her fellow participants literally preaching them on the streets. This tells me she's projecting her own prejudices onto the counter-protesters she claimed would have a civil conversation with her, and in doing so, she comes off as self-righteous and ignorant. I don't see how by any means a conversation about wanting to deprive a child of their personhood would be civil in the first place, but here we are. That woman she mentioned that told her that she is responsible for the deaths of kids in that demographic seemed hyperbolic at first, but then I understood that she was right to call her out. The fact this therapist worked with children with suicidal thoughts is not lost on me either. It's not ironic in the slightest that she said that. That woman's comment was accurate because for a licensed therapist that specializes in suicide prevention, to participate in a rally advocating against medical care for transgender youth is nothing short of disgraceful. It's absolutely mortifying that this is her line of work. Yes, you tell me to leave kids alone, but you talk about them like they're commodities. The slogans on these signs at the rally and the indifference to child molestations perpetrated by one of your own has made that tangible. One slogan I'd like to point out, we don't hate, we object. Big difference is rubbish when that objection comes from a place of hate toward a marginalized group. Disagreeing with paying shipping and handling when buying an item online is a valid objection. Someone that's allergic to seafood telling their friend not to take them to a restaurant that serves shrimp is a valid objection. Declining to see a movie because you've seen it before and you want to see another that's playing in theaters is a valid objection. A parent confronting a middle school English teacher because their students read Heartstopper for a unit is a ridiculous disagreement if the argument is that the graphic novel series depicted two boys in a romantic relationship. If someone can explain how a sitcom about a budding romance between a high school jock and a freckled looking girl taking honors classes is not degrading America's morals, but Heartstopper is, besides two boys kissing, then please, tell me. I've been livid about the ramifications of parental rights laws going into effect when ContraPoints tweeted a thread last August explaining that conservative activists can brand almost any form of media they disagree with to be pornographic. The penultimate episode of Good Luck Charlie, Down a Tree, meets that standard because a friend of the titular baby has same-sex parents. Many assumed the show was cancelled as a result of that subplot when the real reason was that this episode happened to have taken place before the series finale. It's exactly what penultimate means. ContraPoint starts off her thread by quote tweeting another user and stating, you don't have to be willing to publicly defend pornography to publicly oppose anti-porn laws. DeSantis's Don't Say Gay Bill is promoted as quote-unquote protecting children from hardcore pornography. It has already been used to investigate a teacher for showing a Disney movie. That movie was Strange World. Although the teacher's name has been cleared, she has since resigned from her job. It was a horrible situation to read about. ContraPoints continues. We've been through all of this before. In 1933, Joyce's Ulysses was ruled not obscene because, whilst in many places the effect of Ulysses on the reader undoubtedly is somewhat enigmatic, nowhere does it tend to be an aphrodisiac. In other words, it's okay that the book makes you vomit because it probably doesn't turn anyone on. These are the sorts of arguments we'll have to make again to protect quote-unquote obscene media. 
because there is no unambiguous standard for what defines quote-unquote pornography. I know it when I see it. Who is I, Clarence Thomas, lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, who determines artistic value? Again, fucking Clarence Thomas? Do we want this? This is important. Extremely short-sighted radical feminists have sometimes thought they can fight exploitation of women by teaming up with the religious right on this. But the religious right is never your ally. They're against gender equality. They will use anti-porn laws to ban feminist texts. It's not hard to imagine how Republicans will enforce anti-porn laws. They will argue same-sex kissing in movies is quote-unquote pornography. A book about a girl with two mommies? Pornography! Trans-inclusive sex education on YouTube? Pornography! I predict this video is going to be targeted for that exact reason. I just know it. The replies in that thread are extremely ominous. Sam K. tweeted, Yep, my son has a children's book that Moms for Liberty has tried to ban for grooming because there's a page that says some kids have two mommies or two daddies. That scares me. That tweet in particular sends a chill down my spine because of how accurate it is. That person tweeted, Just sex education alone will be labeled as pornography. Never mind how helpful sex education in school is important to help victims of child abuse to identify and report abusive situations in their household. We must protect children by not protecting them. Wow, they spoke the words right out of my mouth. The use of the term Rainbow Mafia induces fear and hatred into the average user with right-leaning views. They click on the post or video with the term front and center in the hope of how they can scream to their communities that their queer and trans neighbors are indoctrinating students and are going to hell. Now they have a new ally under the name LGBTS United, a gender-critical troll account that uses Twitter as an outlet to tweet and endorse discrimination against the trans community. On their GoFundMe campaign they set up, they claim that they mean them no harm despite the fact that they profusely refer to trans women as trans pretenders, and in one tweet where they misgendered a parent attempting to breastfeed their child, men in pretty dresses. Like, what in tarnation is a trans pretender? Is it for LGBTS United to insinuate that individuals and younger generations are identifying as transgender because it's trendy? Or is it that they have convinced themselves that a trans woman cannot identify as a woman because they were born male? It's foul and incredibly misguided either way. An example that caught my eye where LGBTS United used that slur was last November when they quote tweeted someone that posted a link to an article by a transphobic news outlet that reported that a female boxer withdrew from her match with Maya Wamsme an hour before scheduled when she learned her opponent is a transgender woman. I'm going to take a look at their statement and pray that I can still keep my appetite for dinner. It's plainly disgusting to use it to describe accomplished transgender athletes, so here goes nothing. The best way to not be publicly outed as a mediocre male athlete pretending to be a woman so you can beat up on women is to get the hell out of women's sports. Males do not belong in women's sports, period. This is not debatable. You want to fight someone, then go beat up on another trans pretender male. Easy peasy. I'm having a migraine. The reading comprehension in that tweet is awful. I am not surprised that J.K. Rowling follows that news outlet. Algerian boxer Iman Khalil's first victory in a boxing match of the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris made international news for the same reason Redux Magazine wrote that article. Other outlets and public figures with ties to the right wing have swiftly accused her of being born male because her fight with Italian boxer Angela Carnini lasted less than a minute and she failed a gender eligibility test carried out by an association that has been decertified as an international boxing organization and is not recognized by the International Olympic Committee. This backlash toward Amman has one tiny problem that differs from Maya Wildsmith's predicament. 
She's not transgender. She never has been, and she's competed in both the Olympics and women's tournaments before. The Olympic Charter has affirmed that access to sports is a human right. This means by having discussions about restricting trans athletes from competing in sports, we are sending a message to them that they are undeserving of humanity. I am not much of a sports fan, but during the times my father took me on his golf outings and from playing Mario sports games, I've come to believe that it is a freedom of expression. Angela Carnini supports that right for Amon to compete and in addition to feeling humiliated that she had to deal with this bullying online, she apologized for not shaking her hand. Angela forfeited her match with Amon because she was punched so hard her nose was bleeding. She couldn't stay in the ring much longer and risk further injury. She had to think of her physical health but she said that Amon shouldn't have to suffer for her victory. Angela said that if she were to meet her again, she'd give her a hug. Failing to show respect and humility toward an opponent is worse than losing a competition. It all worked out for Amon in the end. She went on to emerge triumphant in a match with Chinese boxer Yang Lu and win a gold medal in the Paris Olympics. She has proven that unity, fairness, and cooperation in sports is stronger than hate and now wishes to make an example out of J.K. Rowling, Donald Trump, and Elon Musk to name a few in a cyber harassment complaint she requested her lawyer's firm to fire with Paris' prosecution office. She has my full support on this decision to seek justice for the hate she's gotten and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that she wins this fight. A handful of news outlets have reported that public figures named in the lawsuit could be sentenced to five years in jail should it be successful, but how that would be enforced remains to be seen. In my opinion, it's not going to happen, but being found guilty of participating in a witch hunt against one innocent individual by a court overseas could stain J.K. Rowling's and Elon Musk's reputations forever. The former did say she'd gladly serve time in jail then take back her comments. She won't be complaining. I recall when I took a shower in the locker room after I went swimming at a YMCA earlier this year, a man that was in a star next to me asked me, you know this is the men's locker room, right? My instinctive answer was, of course, I'm obviously a dude. He didn't engage any further, thank God, but it was humiliating and it got me to realize that because of how I sound, I might easily become a target in male spaces if I'm not careful. Granted, he didn't get a glimpse of me, so the best case scenario would be that he got the wrong idea because he only heard my voice. It's part of how being on the autism spectrum affects my life, but it still feels degrading and invasive to me to have to prove that I'm a man. The backlash that shook the Paris Olympics and the potential lawsuit filed by Iman's lawyer has caused the right wing to come under heavy fire for once again dictating what makes an individual a woman. If having high levels of testosterone in the human body and being physically stronger than an opponent automatically makes an athlete a man, women would eventually not be allowed to compete. So I'm sorry, LGBTS United, it is very much debatable because your reasoning is laced with misogyny and racism. We typically think of testosterone for its role in the development of a man's sex drive, but women rely on it too for similar reasons. It's beneficial for lowering their cholesterol, improving durability in their bone structures, and it allows them to properly regulate their periods. The anti-trans sentiments that LGBTS United promoted on Twitter did not age gracefully because by advocating to exclude trans individuals from sports and laboratories, they are actually harming cis women. It endangered a little girl with short hair at a school event in British Columbia last June because an entitled couple thought that sentiment gave them permission to inspect her genitals. Her mother, Heidi Starr, said the encounter left her traumatized. She stated that her daughter was physically vibrating, she was sobbing, she was in and out of tears all day till bedtime that day. And right-wing politicians argue the LGBT plus community is grooming minors? Yuck! The guest that Connecticut Valley Views has for its Challenging the Rainbow Mafia segment is a transgender activist from Middletown named Christine Rebstock. She's previously been on the show a couple of times with her most recent appearance being an in-person interview at a forum, Moms for Liberty, held in Avon last October. She has written a couple of anti-trans fear-mongering articles that were published in the Connecticut Mirror, one of which is about the state needing a fair, calm discussion about gender-affirming care for minor patients. 
and by fair, she means proposing to restrict them from having access to it and deprive them of their bodily autonomy in the name of parental rights. What about parents that are supportive of their children transitioning? Then it's considered child abuse and protective services places kids receiving that medical treatment in foster homes. It would have been legal in Texas if an Austin-based appellate court didn't tell the state that a trans kid's appointments with their doctors are not their business. If they are transitioning without their parents' knowledge, chances are they were living in bad homes. School administrators have every right to refuse to inform their parents about what their children are struggling with if they are the cause of it. So Christine's claim in her article that they have no training in mental health is tone deaf and disrespectful to their profession. And this is coming from someone whose parents are retired teachers. It's not just because the safety and welfare of students is an educator's number one priority, but it is because mental health training is an essential qualification for the job that allows them to build empathy with a student that tells them they don't feel safe at home. They may not have the same level of expertise in trans issues as doctors and psychologists, but they can send referrals to clinics that specialize in gender-affirming care and notify law enforcement if the student they're helping is in immediate danger. Branding a kid struggling with their identity as quote-unquote immature and quote-unquote impressionable will make it harder for them to reach out for support. The sources Christine cited have either been cherry-picked to portray sympathetic educators as a network of predators or all come from conservative-leaning websites that sweep the rising suicide rates in LGBT plus youth under the rug. Last August, she further perpetuates the invalidation of trans women's gender identities by stating that they are trans for a reason in a YouTube short. Hi, I've seen it stated on various social media forums. Trans women are women. Well, I'm a transsexual woman, and I'm going to tell you that that's a false statement. Women are women. Trans women are trans women. We are trans for a reason. We are born male. Due to gender dysphoria, we transition to live as the opposite sex for us women. We do everything we can to look, act, and assimilate our lives as a woman, but we can never become biological woman. A tr no trans woman could get pregnant, have periods, or have any need for feminine products. So women are women, trans women are trans women. Perhaps Slytherin, or maybe Hufflepuff, uh, or trans women aren't really women. Wait, what? I mean, uh, the first two things. Okay, who's the next girl or boy? There's only those two. Many trans women, competent therapists that offer support to trans patients and gender studies professors would heavily disagree with Christine's comments. The Cleveland Clinic and trans writer Christine Penn both have articles published that debunks this short faster than you can say Levy Corpus. And before you come crying to me, the Cleveland Clinic's article has been reviewed by academics that specialize in the medical field and journalists that kept in touch with healthcare providers employed at the facility, so this offends you, you're free to exit stage left. A trans individual not being able to reconfigure their biological sex doesn't mean they can't identify as their preferred gender or identify as non-binary because gender is a construct created by society to instruct people how they should behave in accordance to their biological sex. It dehumanizes intersex individuals because their bodies and sex characteristics aren't conventional to the gender norms that Christine Rebstock discusses in her interviews on podcasts and programs like Connecticut Valley Views. They face horrific stigma from society and often as children their genitals are mutilated to match their gender assigned at birth, leaving them feeling incredibly miserable and ashamed of what was done to them without their consent. That was the reason Greece passed a law two years ago that banned genital mutilation surgeries on intersex kids. It took its parliament over three decades to recognize that these operations are violations of their rights. Unfortunately, people in Greece still don't have the option to legally self-identify outside the gender binary, but the strict penalties imposed on doctors that perform IGMs is a ray of hope for Greek children living with unsupportive parents. 
If these parents and fanatics in school districts are harping this message that kids are beautiful the way they are and let kids be kids, shouldn't that also apply to those that are intersex? To describe my point in simplest form, gender is not a scientific concept, it's a cultural concept. Trans women may not be able to menstruate like their cisgender peers, but they still need lube products to keep their vaginas moist. Christine Rebstock mimics JK Rowling by claiming if a person cannot menstruate, they're not a real woman. I don't buy it, mainly because as cis women get older, they stop having them and start going through menopause. Trans men, non-binary, and intersex individuals have their periods too, and not every woman gets theirs. If pregnancy is not possible, couples can always look to adopt. Trans women have the option to preserve their sperm at a fertility center until their female partners or a surrogate can use it. One partner not being able to get pregnant shouldn't stop a couple from starting a family, nor does it make a trans woman any less of a woman because 10% of them in the U.S. have trouble conceiving and carrying a baby to term. I'm not claiming that I'm an expert, nor do I have all the answers, but someone that states that trans women aren't really women, like purposely misgendering slash deadnaming them or suggesting they are quote-unquote men in pretty dresses, basically, can't be trusted to be included in discussions that debate on what's best for school-aged children, much less run for public office. Trans people are trans for a reason, and that reason is they were born in the wrong body and want to fix them so they can be comfortable in their own skin. Otherwise, they can't function as people. That's how I look at gender identity disorder because while I can never entirely understand a trans individual's struggle unless I make an effort to befriend them, I know what it's like to have to be something you're not. The interview in Challenging the Rainbow Mafia starts off with Christine telling a life story about her gender dysphoria after Susan Regan welcomed her on the show and she requested her to discuss it. She said in her pre-adolescent years she discovered she was different from her peers. She was born during a time where the trans community was heavily frowned upon and gender affirming operations were scarcely available. To protect themselves, they hid their gender identities and sexual orientations from society and could only be themselves if they went to a bar that encouraged it. There was a wonderful photographer named Jeffrey Silverthorne that paid visits to one in Providence and took portrait shots to give viewers a glimpse of life in that community in the 70s. He additionally went to his subjects' homes to take these pictures with the aim toward depicting them as the people they want to be, not what society wants them to be based on their gender at birth. He wants to show viewers that other people dressing in drag and those that transitioned aren't strange or unsettling. How they express themselves is a part of what it means to be human and Jeffrey sought to embody that in his portrait shots of members of the trans community. He was notably well known for using that approach in his portraits of Cadaver since he believed that beauty exists in death. He was driven to put together a series of photographs that were later published in one of his books titled Morgue when one of his fellow photographers questioned why she'd want to photograph a corpse, which I think is a fair answer. Some artists and audiences are repulsed by the idea, but it is intriguing that Jeffrey associated death with change and dignity. The photos of the bodies at the morgue were taken in a position where we're led to believe that they're still alive. Jeffrey's photos preserved what remained of the people they used to be, giving the dead in that room a sense of dignity and grace. His book was his unique way of honoring them. That facet of his line of work and his beliefs in the human condition reminds me of Sally Mann, another 20th century photographer that was not afraid to defy societal norms to challenge viewers to find beauty in unlikely places. I mostly recognize her from her visits to body farms where she photographed images of corpses in varying stages of decomposition, but she also built a collection of photos of her children to include in her book, Immediate Family. Its publication in 1992 was scandalous. Right-wing politicians and religious leaders were quick to conflate her photos to CP. Sally denied these claims in a statement where she said the photos were meant to portray her kids in scenarios that are natural in a mother's eyes and the intention was to convey a sense of childhood innocence and contentment that can only be found outdoors in rural Virginia. Sally's approach and imagery she expressed in her photography can be viewed as offensive but if you look closely at the photos used in immediate family, like Candy Cigarette, 
you can see that her children were carefree and were enjoying themselves. Sally's photos of them frolicking in the dirt and pretending to be grown-ups captured what it truly means to let kids be kids. Not by shoving the Ten Commandments down their throat for the sake of modesty, but by letting their imaginations run wild and summer vacations are perfect opportunities for them to nurture it on their own and learn from their mistakes. Through public opinion of that collection, Sally Mann exposed how little we're aware of how children behave and see the world. It's what earned her the title of America's Best Photographer from Time Magazine in 2001. She was ahead of her time. Before I steer the topic back to Christine Rebstock's life story, I wanted to issue an additional trigger warning for suicide as well as two more for child abuse and bullying toward transgender youth. She does briefly touch on having had to cope with suicidal thoughts in her early adulthood and had attempted it in 2019 after coming out to her spouse didn't end well. It's a terrifying reality for LGBT plus youth in unsupportive environments and it hits far too close to home for me, so this is just a brief heads up. To make do with the taboo associated with being transgender in the late 1970s, Christine wore her mother's clothing to feel comfortable with herself. She went on to compete on a bowling team in community college and worked in journalism for much of her adult career, but she couldn't be happy with herself unless her body matched her gender identity. It breaks my heart she didn't get the support she needed growing up and that her spouse didn't react well when she came out to her. After having survived that dark point in her life, Christine was finally able to have her transition and she felt close to God. Her journey is not over yet because she stated in her last interview with Susan Regan that she was on hormone replacement therapy, but she is in a better place than she was five years ago and I respect that. Judging from Christine's story, you'd think she'd be more sympathetic to transgender youth. I wish the interview kept it about her life story and what it was like to be trans in the late 20th century. That way, she can be a role model that inspires trans youth to explore what makes them who they are without being ashamed of it. The interview went off to a strong start that drove me to learn more about that time period, but she undermines this completely when she said, Oh yeah, these kids are being lied to. They don't know what they're doing. Although I covered Christine's beliefs briefly in my video last year where I condemned Moms for Liberty for holding that forum in Avon, I got the impression that she would be more understanding, but in the back of my mind, I knew her agenda was to legally mandate educators to talk struggling youth out of questioning their identities and outing them to largely prejudiced communities. More trans youth would be forced to suffer the same tribulations she did because of the harmful misinformation she regularly preaches. Some members of the LGBT plus community that lean on the more conservative side of politics and parents believe that kids shouldn't be learning about these issues until they're older, which I emphasize with to an extent because they're complex even for me to wrap my head around and almost every post about Pride Month that was posted on my feed when I was still learning about it was sexualized. On the other hand, I grew to believe the sooner kids learn about the hardships their queer peers face every day, the sooner they learn to be accepting individuals and come to realize that their feelings are natural. By advocating to keep that subject matter out of public schools, they are not being protected, they're being suffocated, and they're more likely to act out. That is where the discussion at the Moms for Liberty Forum about restricting books comes in. Susan recaps her attendance at the forum by replaying a portion of that video. Her continued bias against the protesters outside demonstrates that she has not learned anything from the backlash she had received from families and concerned citizens that showed up to the senior center to protest the forum. One of the proposals outlined in Project 2025 should Donald Trump be re-elected is using the military to break up and detain protesters. It's why it's risky for people in Russia to openly protest Vladimir Putin's war with Ukraine, and why people in North Korea face execution for disagreeing with Kim Jong-un. I was scrolling through a post in an atheist community on Reddit detailing the chilling effect this could have on our rights to exercise freedom of speech, and someone that served in the military commented that many won't willingly enforce it because they swore an oath to protect the United States. Not the Bible, nor the President, the United States. George Washington never wanted to have absolute authority to begin with. The reason the colonists rebelled against the British Crown during the American Revolution was to get rid of it. I may not be a practicing Christian, but we are not an authoritarian theocracy, and most Connecticut families certainly don't want public schools to be remodeled into churches. 
I believe the police were present outside the senior center to maintain order and ensure the protest remained peaceful, but in a growing number of states, someone could risk getting shot for calling attention to racial inequality as we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement. The protesters in Avon were fortunate that their demonstration did not escalate to violence beyond slightly physical altercations, but by calling out the attendees at the forum as terrorists, it got me to realize that they were patriotic. They were fighting for their children's right to be educated without outside interference. It was quite animus uh, and very vocal. Uh, their message was accusing you and other people who were attending the event uh, inside the building. And they were accusing uh, those people of wanting to burn books, which was not really the case. Could you give us a little bit more explanation about the burning books and their, their uh, vocal verbiage. I mean, it almost got to a physical thing outside people pushing and shoving and so forth. Just give us a little more description of what happened that day. That day was unbelievable. Well, burning books is fake news. Banning books is fake news. How is it fake news if states across the country have laws in effect where these books are forbidden and that Scholastic had planned to place books that cover race, gender, and sexuality in a separate catalog and let the schools decide if they should allow it? Teachers, authors, and free speech advocate groups accuse Scholastic of bending to the whims of parents and politicians that are scared school-aged kids will read about their ancestors' mistakes and learning about history from the perspective of a marginalized individual. Melinda Coe, a queer New York Times best-selling author that writes young adult novels, has an article on her website that contains a list of nine states where her books were challenged and a blurb on Louisiana reported that a law was passed where students are required to get parental permission to check out books that were considered quote-unquote sexually explicit. Doesn't it seem suspicious that challenged books lately that fall under that label focus on these issues? Back when I was in the age group Christine Rebstock is targeting and going on to work as an IT assistant at a consolidated school, books on racial segregation and power-hungry leaders in fiction novels were available in libraries and white supremacy was covered in units on the Civil War and biographies on Martin Luther King Jr. and Jackie Robinson. I didn't fully understand the topic in elementary school, but when I was reading the script of a play about Martin Luther King Jr.'s early life with a paraprofessional as part of an assignment, I remember seeing dialogue in a couple of scenes where a white peer told him, my dad will beat me if I play with you, and Martin later asking his mother, why does my skin color matter? My immediate thoughts at the time were, that's not fair, this isn't right. More state laws that make it easier to remove books from public libraries are being considered in a local broadcast program like Connecticut Valley Views willfully ignoring the outcomes of these bans is disturbing. That day or any other parental rights event I've been to, there is zero mention of books to be banned. We're just saying we want books to be age appropriate for our school aged children. And I'm the, as the executive director of media and communications for LGBTS United, I'll say that our organization stands with parents and parental rights groups. We oppose diversity, equity, inclusion curriculums in government public schools, as well as we oppose the sexualization and use of puberty blockers and surgeries for minor age children. And we object to any gender transition for minor age children that emanates from outside the house, household and done without parental knowledge and consent. And books like Gender Queer, which I had read at expert at the Connecticut State Board of Ed meeting in November is sexually explicit mm -hmm. and doesn't is not appropriate for school aged children in their libraries. You're not fooling anyone, Christine. Book bans were not explicitly brought up at the forum because the event was scrutinized by the protesters outside. Panelists in Avon are aware that any discussion about it will cause tensions between Mouths for Liberty and their critics to escalate. Not to the point of violence, hopefully not, but to the point where they'll say, You know what? Get out of our town. We're not letting you anywhere near our schools. These sectarians are counting on their votes to claim control of the curriculum so they can't risk making enemies with the communities they're appealing to. That's how they lost ground in several school districts in Florida and the reason much of suburban Connecticut hates them. A proposal to restrict access to challenged books is easier to approve because then it tricks voters into believing they'll still be available. 
save for the extra hurdle that students would have to jump through. I'd be cutting corners if I said there was nothing to get worked up about because parents could always just ask for a restricted book on behalf of their child if they're interested, but I don't trust a parental rights group when they state they don't want books banned, and certainly not after a Moms for Liberty chapter quoted Adolf Hitler in a newsletter. When it came to power, Germany's education system was drastically altered and a research facility devoted to sexology and advocacy for queer and trans rights was ransacked by young Nazi sympathizers and over 20,000 books were burned later in the streets. Nowadays, in the education system, the challenged book eventually disappears quietly from schools and public libraries and no one would think to look for it. The author of the book in question, Maya Kobabe, stated in their interview with Dan Coys on Slate that Gender Queer, a coming-of-age memoir about the decision to identify as non-binary, is not for younger audiences to read, so Christine was preaching to the choir at the school board meeting. She only read one page from the book and declared it was not age-appropriate without looking into what the book is about. Failing to read more than the first chapter, or page for that matter, is a common deficiency in cause to ban or restrict books that touch on queer and gender identity. Maya touches on this point when they mention that they only included sexually explicit material that they thought was significant to the story they wanted to tell in their memoir. Maya sparingly talked about their experiences with masturbation and their use of a sex toy because they were keeping it focused on how they helped them think about their gender identity. We do not know the number of the page Christine Rebstock read at that board meeting, but I'd wager it is that part. Right-leaning activists and parents that lean on the conservative side rely on a distorted, surface-level summary that paints the book as more provocative than it really is. That's how they use fear-mongering as a persuasion tactic to convince school officials and library directors to remove it from publicly available spaces. If Christine argued that genderqueer is not suitable for elementary school students because the aforementioned subject matter is too abstract for them to absorb into digestible pieces, I'd be happy to agree, but it's not practical to deny high school students access to it because they are at a point in their lives where they need the information most in order to avoid having unsafe sex, and not all of them can afford books themselves. Christine doesn't want these kids, particularly those questioning their identities, to learn about Maya's coming out story at all. It's going to cause more LGBT plus youth living in conservative households to feel hopeless and unloved, and worse, we'd lose more of them to suicide. If you'd like me to review that book on my channel, let me know because Christine's disdain toward it has me considering taking a closer look. Moving on. And that's what it's about. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, doing it too early, indoctrinating these young people, confusing them. Um, let's let's talk a little bit. Let, let's be very candid about this. When they perform or they do the pill blockers and they perform actual surgery and parents are not involved, perhaps not even uh, their own pediatrician, the children's pediatrician. I mean, we don't know what goes on behind these closed doors, but if in fact, uh, what, what do they call the bottom changing if they were to remove uh, male testicles and so forth and then um, the breast uh, either augmentation or uh, removal of breast tell, tell them how critical this is to not be doing this at y this young age because you've seen cases when people at age 20 or 21 uh, suddenly go what a mistake i made and nothing can be reversed why we have detransitioners is easy they did not have gender identity disorder. That's not true. 0.40% of transgender individuals detransition, and the 5% that do, don't regret having had these procedures. A central reason they feel they've made a mistake for going through with it and they choose to go back to their assigned gender at birth is because of external pressure they face. They don't have a solid support system, they can't afford expenses that cover the cost of continuing treatment necessary for transitioning, and they face problems at work once these operations are done. That is a huge issue because sometimes their co-workers and or employers are not as accepting and cannot accommodate them. It breaks my heart that a person is forced to discontinue treatment to get any discrimination or harassment they may face to stop. Sometimes people detransition because their gender identity shifted. They may identify as male one day, and the next, they may identify as female. The day after that, they might want to identify as male again, and that's perfectly fine. 
Unfortunately, the insistence for individuals to have to prove they are either male or female to receive medical care needed for transitioning erases the existence of non-binary individuals. They aren't as recognized in the LGBT plus community, and in some countries like the UK, they cannot legally identify as neither gender under state ID cards and documentation such as passports. This could prevent non-binary patients from receiving the medical treatment that's suitable for their needs, and they may later decide not to go through with transitioning completely if it doesn't correspond with their gender identities. As a result, they are erroneously listed as detransitioners, alienating them further. I know it sounds confusing to explain, and it seems like a lot to take in, but I find it saves a lot of trouble to take a person at their word when they tell you their gender identity. Christine's claim that everyone that detransitioned never had gender dysphoria is scornful toward individuals that choose to do so for a reason besides regret, as well as gender fluid individuals that had bottom surgery, and it's blatantly rude. I think the medical industry and the sit and everyone behind this, this political leaders too, we're seeing. I guess we can see it in front of our front of our face that many kids have a pre-existing mental health comorbidity. Community, but it's being diagnosed as gender dysphoria. That's a term they use today. It used to be called gender identity disorder. It is a mental health disorder. And I think the stigma of that, that's why we see that was in the Obama regime. The switch in the DSM code was changed, but it is a mental health disorder. And it's being glossed over in kids. Hey, here you go, your gender dysphoria. Hey, next thing you know, if you put on life altering medication, you go down the road, you can't return. And for the people to say, well, they don't do surgeries on kids. Well, the Connecticut Sentinel article uh, proved, uh, showed six top surgeries. That's breast removal for trans boys, ages 15 through 17, from a period of uh, 2017 to 2020 in Hartford Healthcare. And that was on Husky cell. That was taxpayer funded operations. Mm -hmm. I only hope and pray that those um, those kids they don't regret their surgery and there's no long and they're not having any long term health repercussions from that. Mm -hmm. They only have to be careful. You said the term gender affirming care. That's not a right term. We need to confirm that one has gender identity disorder, not affirm it. So we so we need more mental health people involved in this. Yes, we need more gatekeeping. Absolutely more gatekeeping and parents and keeping parents involved. Christine elaborates on her misguided answer by proposing that Connecticut's medical system should have stricter guidelines on treatment for trans kids that's similar to the United Kingdom where trans individuals are put on waiting lists and are made to wait for up to three years if not slightly more or less for a patient's first appointment at a gender identity clinic. Four years ago, the National Health Service promised to reduce the length of time to wait down to 18 weeks, but LGBT Foundation found that the average wait can be 18 months. An article published on them reported that more recent data has shown that transgender adults are made to wait seven years for their appointments. This has led to them giving up hope that they could receive bottom surgery and, as Christine put it in her life story, be their true selves. A transgender woman that was interviewed by the BBC from around that time, Andrea Halili, said the prolonged waiting period made her feel like she was unimportant. Every day she waited for an assessment from a consultant is another day where the person she presents herself to be is at war with the person she really is. And as long as the latter does not align with her identity, it's agony. Speaking of, I found a PDF file from March 5th on the Maine State Legislator's website that contains a blurb that Christine typed to the government vocalizing her opposition to a bill that granted ironclad legal protection to health professionals that provided gender-affirming and reproductive care. This allowed Maine to be a sanctuary for women traveling from states that outlawed abortion and questioning children that don't feel safe at home. The bill faced heavy opposition from Republican lawmakers that argued that traffickers could exploit it, and while Christine was grasping at straws in her PDF document by stating, 0.5% of the U.S. population is transgender, that means kids questioning their gender can't be trans. She sees the bill as the dismantlement of parental interference. Her argument was that the UK no longer provided puberty blockers to children, but she did not specify how trans kids benefited from that restriction. Maybe she felt she didn't need to, 
but their sentiments on the bail in Maine may have been inspired by a ruling from three high court judges that kids under 16 that struggle with gender dysphoria cannot give informed consent to take puberty blockers. The only exception would be if a court approves of that part of their treatment, but again, that would require the child to have to prove they are either male or female, and supposing the child identifies as neither, they could be denied access entirely. The High Court ruling has repeatedly been proven to be incorrect even before it went into effect. A month prior to this event, for example, the National Health Service was sued by a 14-year-old transgender boy because he had waited a year for a referral to the only NHS-affiliated gender clinic that catered to his age group. He had a good support system both at home and at school, but he only managed to get help for his transition through private health care that cost a fortune. Just like Andrea Halili and older members of the trans community, the kid's anxiety and depression has increased over his changing body and the reality of having to wait months if not years to get that treatment. He has known up to 30 trans people from school and in LGBT plus groups that have not received it yet. It's been four years since that article was published, but it would be frightening but not surprising if they're still waiting for their first appointments from that gender clinic. Another example that came up midway through August that's strongly related is that the state of Montana overturned a law that required a minor to get parental consent before receiving an abortion. The argument coming from activists claiming they're protecting children that a kid will need permission to terminate their pregnancy is hypocritical. Attorneys that represented Planned Parenthood argued that before that decision was made, Montana could not cite a legitimate health or safety risk that justified the law, nor would their interests apply neutrally. The kids that need these procedures most are often on the short end of the stick when there are arguments about whether they should receive it or not. The High Court in the UK claims that the ruling on puberty blockers was done to protect vulnerable teenagers, and some that detransition because they haven't had adequate guidance were in favor of it, but the waiting list and public opinions of the trans community in that country, mostly from J.K. Rowling, have not gotten any better. When Christine suggested that more mental health professionals should be involved in assisting trans children, she did not understand that there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to providing them access to gender-affirming care, and that sort of gatekeeping has done more significant harm than good. Not every child figuring out their identity and have questions about gender should be prescribed with puberty blockers on the spot. The side effects are not as permanent as the right is portraying it to be, but if taken incorrectly and if patients are not informed enough, the medication can indeed be damaging to their development. That likely explains why Christine said, interrupting a child's puberty is gambling with their long-term future health, even though it's both grammatically and psychologically incorrect. I say grammatically because long-term and future literally share the same definition, so it's either one word or the other, or else the sentence looks thrown together. I say psychologically incorrect because trans kids that are coerced to go through puberty knowing the changes it'll bring to their bodies aren't going to match their gender identities is worse for their mental health. Without puberty blockers to give them more time to assess their options before permanent changes to their bodies kick in, their teen years will be excruciating. If a child has questions about what to expect from gender-affirming care or about gender slash sexuality for the sake of curiosity, that's what supportive parents, pediatricians, and competent therapists are here for. Christine and Susan don't care about family values if another parent's values deviate from theirs. Do I think restrictions on gender-affirming care for trans children in Connecticut would be absolute? No. The state has a long history of welcoming the LGBT plus community, and laws that restrict medical care for trans and non-binary youth would drive them out. The only argument that Christine Repstock made about gender-affirming care I agree with is that it should be given to young patients only if they are absolutely sure that this is what they want, but then again, she's made it clear that she thinks those that go through with it are brainwashed regardless of whether or not their parents are involved. Um, this is where I see a little bit another favorite topic, uh, something that I am hoping that we can do something about is uh, the cost of special education. Now, I, I see a little overlap, and you tell me if you agree with me, that in special education, we have students that have a wide range of issues. Um, they are treated uh, with uh, medical care. Uh, it includes autism, various 
things on the spectrum, uh, children that cannot physically manage themselves, and they attend uh, classes in a curriculum uh, according to uh, what has been determined by boards that include parents, uh, therapy people, uh, and there are tests that they go through, and then they determine a curriculum that is best for them, and they attend institutions that will address, address those issues. Now, it seems to me as though this is even further confusing, because what you have is children who could be open to the indoctrination of this gender-changing thing, because they're already vulnerable to begin with. Um, do you agree with me that you see some overlap there? I can agree that there is an overlap between the autism spectrum and gender issues, but not for the reason Susan has stated because she paints autistic children as more easily impressionable than their able-bodied peers. NPR reported that transgender and non-binary individuals are six times more likely to be on the spectrum. Dr. Lawrence Fun, a psychiatrist from Stanford University that was interviewed for the report, stated that autistic girls might appear masculine and have more levels of testosterone, while autistic males may sound and appear more feminine. This applies to me specifically as an autistic person. I've had little kids say that I sound like a girl because my voice is higher than a typical cisgender man. They don't know any better. They can't help pointing it out so it doesn't bother me, don't get me wrong. I always just tell them. I get that a lot. One time when that happened at my previous job, my mother, who taught math at the time, used it as a teaching moment about acceptance and that everyone is different. I never questioned my gender identity at a young age because I am very much comfortable with my assigned gender at birth. For transgender and non-binary kids, it's clearly the opposite, and for others, listening to comments that their voices sound like a certain gender and grown-ups calling them nasty names can be extremely hurtful. If there are parents encouraging this behavior and teaching them that only boys can play with action figures, only girls can wear dresses, and that their way of thinking is the only way to see the world, in other words... Girls, Lisa, boys kiss girls. Now that's indoctrination. What this is about is teaching kids to be intolerant and stifle their curiosity so they don't ask questions if these beliefs are wrong or can somehow be adjusted. To me, that's what diversity, equity, and inclusion is about at its core. It's not a perfect system, but abolishing it isn't the answer. While it is highly recommended for parents to consult with a psychologist to check if their child has special needs, here when dealing with gender dysphoria, Christine's proposal to deal with the autism first is not a good idea because the answer comes down to which condition is more serious, and not every patient that has both will be in the same situation. Autism is also largely overrepresented in people with gender dysphoria. Daniel Sullivan, another individual that was interviewed by NPR, is a neurodiversity coach that identifies as non-binary and wasn't diagnosed with autism until their adulthood. They didn't change their mind about their identity after they received their diagnosis, but it helped them understand why they always felt like they were different from everyone else. Danielle explained that they benefited from being on the spectrum because seeing the world from a different perspective allowed them to question and challenge gender norms. A cisgender boy with autism may enjoy fashion and is into henna tattoos, for example. These qualities don't indicate that he identifies as the opposite gender. It just means he has special interests like I do with game development and fine art. Other people, however, that enjoy activities or have interests that clash with gender roles may have none of these issues hastily assuming that they have either one is humiliating for them to have to deal with and it's outright disgusting. Oh yes, I think we're seeing the kids with autism being diagnosed with gender dysphoria when we have to deal with their, with their autism first. Mm. Again, you, you can't reverse the medication we take. <laughs> Special... What about pill blockers? What about pill blockers? What kinds of effects? Are, well, uh, they have Lupron and them. Lupron's. If you mean pill blockers, what what are they trying to evoke? Well, you're trying to stop your growth. And to me, interrupting a child's puberty is gambling with their long-term future health. How can you take a 12 or 13 year old kid or 11 who's maybe what Paul told me four something, and they're going to grow five over five feet, and you put a pause? There's going to be some ramifications when they're on blockers and now they're. 15 or where they start hormone replacement therapy at 14, which is a little too young for 
I would like to see that raised to like 16. Mm -hmm. I just, well, no one can tell me an answer, but you, there's gotta be repercussions. And Lupron is used in puberty blockers and Lupron's a drug to use to castrate sex offenders. So if we're going to castrate sex offenders, how, but it's being told it's safe and reversible for our young children. I don't buy that. Mm. And that's someone that and we're not hearing that in, in their lamestream media. Puberty blockers aren't the only medications that contain Lupron. Besides its use in castrating sex offenders, the substance is also used to treat prostate cancer, endometriosis, and help increase a shorter kid's height. It can weaken the bone density of many young patients that are mostly women, leading them to go through mood swings, headaches, cracking teeth, seizures, and joint pain. One patient was diagnosed with osteopenia when she was 11 and it took 5 years for her bone density to recover. During that time, she was plagued with feelings of worthlessness that had led to suicidal thoughts due to her aspirations being inhibited by chronic pain. As I said, these side effects are an obvious reason why Christine Rebstock doesn't believe that puberty blockers are reversible, despite Planned Parenthood stating that they're not compulsory to take before starting hormone replacement therapy, and that several studies in Europe found that bone density in kids that were on Lupron does eventually return to normal once they've reached a point where they no longer need it. Last April, a mother of a daughter questioning her gender identity posted on the endometriosis subreddit to get a second opinion on if Lupron is suitable for her treatment. It wasn't the appropriate space for her to ask that question, but her heart was in the right place and she wanted to make sure the treatment her daughter wanted wouldn't cause long-lasting damage. Most of the users that commented disagreed, citing concerns about loss of bone density and stating that they wouldn't want to put their children through the pain they've experienced from taking that substance. They suggested consulting with a hormone specialist and addressing their concerns with a therapist that recommended Lupron, which is actually wise because they recognize that their advice can only go so far. This reply from a user who is more familiar with the use of Lupron to delay puberty profoundly summarized what to expect from taking the medicine and has listed two factors for the mother to think about to reassure her that she doesn't have to rely heavily on them before starting gender-affirming care. This user has stated the following in the reply. Hi, I have endometriosis, but I'm also familiar with the use of Lupron and similar medications to pause puberty. Offline, I know a few people who are on puberty blockers and a larger number of people who wish that puberty blockers had been available to them when they were younger. Endometriosis symptoms usually start in puberty and it takes a while to get diagnosed. You're not going to find many people here who took Lupron at the beginning of puberty. Our experiences here are going to be very different and you might be better off talking to parents whose kids went on Lupron to delay puberty for gender reasons or because they started puberty early, such as premature puberty slash precocious puberty. For the former, parent support groups wherever your daughter would be getting Lupron is probably the best way to find other parents to ask. If you're looking online, most of the medical information is going to be about kids with precocious puberty. The bone density will increase again when she either decides to proceed with puberty caused by her internal endocrine system or with puberty caused by gender-affirming hormone therapy. If you're worried about it causing permanent decreased bone density once kids have gone through puberty one way or another, I don't think that's been proven and it doesn't appear to be happening. However, there haven't been the kind of really large studies that would prove conclusively that it doesn't happen. There are a couple of things to consider regarding bone density. Number one, kids with distress about gender often show up to gender clinics with lower than normal bone density for their age even though they haven't started puberty blockers yet. This is because many of these kids have either tried to eat as little as possible to delay puberty and or stop menstrual periods or they've become withdrawn and aren't running around and playing. I know people who did the former in early adolescence to try and stop it from happening. It sucked, messed up their relationship with food and how they felt about their body, and they all wish puberty blockers had been available to them. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Number two, if you're worried about how long your daughter will be on Lupron from a bone density perspective, keep in mind that if she decides she doesn't want female puberty, you don't need to keep her on just puberty blockers until 18. In most places, once a child feels sure about how they want to proceed and the clinicians feel confident about that the parent or parents can give permission for the child to start gender-affirming hormone therapy, at which point bone density will quickly recover. 
Depending on how soon your child is sure about puberty and how long it takes for the doctors to feel confident that she's sure, she might only be on Lupron for a year or two. Then this user leaves this note in brackets. I assumed above that your daughter was assigned female at birth and is now questioning her gender. If I have that backwards, go ahead and swap around what I said as appropriate. I wasn't sure either, but the mother left a reply stating that she was grateful for the input. I just love that this mother was being cautious about her daughter's health while keeping an open mind to new opinions. It's a relief to see. If you're still unsure if puberty blockers are safe for kids questioning their gender identities to take, consult with a primary care doctor, not someone using potential side effects from the medication as an excuse to instill moral panic to get that treatment outlawed for people that need it sooner rather than later. So, do you think that one, either parents or therapy people, are you able to differentiate an actual issue, a gender confusing issue, dysphoria, from one who has just been exposed to these books, uh, these events uh, where transgender people are there, they're putting on dancing, whatever, uh, encouraging library books that are out there for children in some of our schools and institutions. Do you think that we're able to actually identify the ones who truly have a problem and those who have just been indoctrinated? I think includes. <laughs> yeah. The amount of there's 1.6 million trans people in the country. That's a percentage of the population. But there's so many kids who are quote identifying as trans. Why is that? Well, we have social media. It's poisonous. Mm -hmm. I wish parents would put the brakes on kids going on Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, etc. Social media is indeed dangerous for young people if they're not careful, but it is not a good enough reason to deny them access to it when their friends are inevitably going to recommend them to make an account and that they will, at some point in their lives, have neighbors, friends, classmates, teachers, and relatives in the LGBT plus community. It only seems appropriate for schools to teach them that some men can love men and some women love women so they don't look at public displays of affection from same-sex couples as abnormal and for closeted kids as something to be ashamed of. They are still curious about the world around them and as poisonous as social media is, it plays a vital role in fostering that curiosity and mentally preparing them to leave the nest. In light of the grooming allegations against Colleen Ballinger and scandals indie game studios face where players slash staff safety isn't prioritized as promised, parental involvement and limited time spent online except for homework is more necessary than ever to foster their kids' emotional development and critical thinking skills. That's not to say parents should hover over their kids' online activity every hour on the hour, but they can advise them not to add people they're not familiar with and teaching them that if something is too good to be true, such as an influencer's desire to connect with them beyond what is considered appropriate, and a scammer posing as a potential date requesting to meet them somewhere secretive, it probably is. These are two situations that parents and sometimes vocational education instructors can use to teach teenagers in lectures about being aware of potential risks online and showing them how to establish boundaries. They don't need to pull the plug on their kids' phones, PCs, or consoles because they don't trust people on the other side of their screens. They can just show them how to identify scammers and misleading posts. In my opinion, based on experience, the most important lesson to teach kids about social media usage and online gaming is to never give out their passwords, no matter how tempting the reward may be. I understand that it's common sense to guard your passwords with your life, but there are still a handful of people so taken in by the promise of free secondary currency, an exclusive in-game character or item, gift cards, and in some cases, admin privileges, that they hand a scammer their personal information, and that's a huge problem that customer support teams can't always fix. It doesn't just affect underage users, anyone that is vulnerable and unable to keep an eye out for sons can fall victim to hackers. And social emotional learning as well as the other the woke diversity, equity, inclusion curriculum such as critical race theory. This brings it into the classroom for elementary school kids. And look what in, in Granby last year, they had the pride videos that they showed when parents opt out that was ignored. 
And how about those eight year olds sent home with puberty kids? Yes. And this is a social contagion. You know, it's, I think kids think, hey, being LGBTQ plus is cool. It's an in thing. No, living with gender identity disorder is brutal. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. I'm pretty sure being LGBT is cool is not what kids are thinking. I've never known a person in my life to have come out as gay, transgender, or non-binary when they were under 18 because it was a fad, though I did have a friend that thought he might be gay until he realized it was all in his head. It wasn't something that was cool or fun for him, especially when there's so much stigma and repercussions that can emerge from coming out depending on where in the United States you're from. It pokes a hole in Christine's logic and it reveals how she views children in general. She does this by belittling their autonomy. If being gay is cool is truly what they're thinking as a result from being on social media, the content they are consuming has made them feel represented and they feel safer in these spaces. Being a part of that gives them this feeling that they don't have to be alone and they'll have hope they'll be accepted once they're ready to come out. They don't have to tell their immediate family right away if they don't want to. They often would first come out to their friends and sometimes their love interests because they trust them most. This allows them to become aware of their interests and personalities so if they're withdrawn, moody, or acting out all of a sudden, they'll know they're going through something. This holds true for their teachers too. Their students' welfare is their top priority. I remember in high school, a classmate was having issues at home. I wasn't aware of what was going on because I wasn't close with him, but I heard a vocational education teacher told him that he shouldn't go on the bus if he doesn't feel safe. I was in the same room and class was either still in session or it just ended when that conversation was had, but it gave me a lot to think about. Christine's mention of kids coming home from school with puberty kids as if they're taught satanic worship shocked me because the point of schools providing these kids is to teach them how to practice good hygiene as their bodies slowly start to change. These kids are handy in beginner classes on sex education where students learn to identify an item in their kit and how it can help them through puberty. I vaguely remember being given that kit when I was that age and this was covered in a 6th grade level speech class. A practical kit can consist of cheap hygienic products you can get at a supermarket. It can include deodorant, a hairbrush, laundry soap, acne cream, a razor, shampoo, conditioner, and for those that need them, menstrual products in case they get their periods when they're not at home. The thought that Christine would consider providing students with a kit to prepare them for puberty as indoctrinating them is mind-boggling and almost ridiculous. Now, for parents out there who are watching this show and who are very concerned about their child, uh, what, what would be the first thing you would recommend? If their child comes home and says, I've been talking to my friend or whatever, uh, or I've been talking to a teacher, they actually admit they've been talking to a teacher, and they say, I, I'm a boy, but I actually feel more like a girl. Uh, if you start to see these clues, what would you recommend a parent do? Where, where do they go? What do they do in order to do the right thing by their child? All right, first things first, take social media away from the kids. Absolutely not. You're just teaching them that they don't deserve autonomy and you've shown me that you don't know jack about their developmental needs. Social media bans aren't going to stop kids from accessing these platforms anyway. They're close to impossible and costly to enforce. It additionally won't help kids make smarter decisions and it can drive a wedge between them and their parents. They can easily circumvent the bans by making an account under a false name, allowing them to log on to social media in secret. These bans would cause these platforms to appear more exciting and enticing. It satisfies their desire to be rebellious against authority and malicious users that are usually older do encourage this risk-taking behavior. The ban on alcoholic beverages during Prohibition had likewise didn't stop people from drinking. Those 13 years made it more glamorous. The ban paved the way for organized crime. Gangsters seized control of businesses that were distributing alcohol in secret in order to satisfy their customers' desires to drink. And it ultimately hurt the economy due to bribery being common practice in criminal proceedings. The St. Valentine's Day massacre perpetrated by rival gangs in Chicago was what it took for President Hoover to realize that the ban on alcohol nationwide wasn't the smartest decision Congress made. How does prohibition connect to suggestions to keep kids off of social media? 
Verifying age and identity with government-issued documents raises privacy concerns since that would require submitting sensitive information to companies like Meta. Hackers and third-party advertisers would retrieve and sell that data unhindered. This will make browsing online unpleasant and even dangerous. The thought of using facial recognition software to open my phone is scary enough. Someone could replicate my face or hover a photo of me over my phone and the operating system won't tell the difference. Antivirus software is not bulletproof in this scenario. They won't protect your personal information if you provide it freely to websites that could be breached at any time. Find out who they're hanging around with, if there's any after school clubs. If there are, see what they're about. Maybe that's the clue from being around the kids. And if they just persist and make an appointment, find a uh, mental health professional. Mm -hmm. One that's not quick to quote affirm someone. And, and your own pediatrician, right? Right. I mean, wouldn't you go yes. to your pediatrician? Perhaps if you have faith in them and you felt good about what they've done for your child thus far, with regard to you know the standard shots for school, and, so, and you're feeling comfortable about that. All right, because it's very critical at this point to catch it as soon as possible, in order to do the right thing. Because if your child, your child is really having. Uh, confusion and it isn't it hasn't been brought on by somebody encouraging them or it's the trendy thing to do or it's a trendy thing to say that I feel this way or whatever. Um, and then this leads to other things is that in school uh, kids are getting harassed uh, for certain things, either for not going along with the crowd or for being different. Normally, that would be the case because almost every student feels pressure to sacrifice a bit of their sense of selves to try and fit in, but here Susan has this backwards. LGBT plus students are approximately twice as likely to be bullied and harassed by their heterosexual cisgender peers, according to Mental Health America. It's no hard to see where Susan's priorities lie, and it's not their safety. Also, the fact that she's the founder and president of a nonprofit organization and runs a scholarship for aspiring creative artists makes her stance all the more disappointing. And I know that you expressed the fact that you were feeling different and you weren't quite sure what to do about it. And was anybody going to understand you? That was a, a, a turnless time for you uh, to try and decide when to come out. And, and I'm sure that in the 70s, you said, uh, that was not only confusing to you, but embarrassing or whatever, correct? Yeah. Hey, you know, at first, I, I'll i say this. I get accused of, quote, hating trans kids. I don't. I want to see them be themselves, but we need to get them proper mental health therapy. Christine and her organization has tweeted all these awful anti-trans sentiments, admitted to not being above outing trans kids, and she expects me to believe that she doesn't hate them? I don't think so. She doesn't have me convinced that her advice is suitable for parents since following it would mean violating their kids' privacy, which in turn would cause them to have trouble setting boundaries in their friendships and love life. They should be allowed to experience the world for themselves and learn from their mistakes. That's what going to school is about. There were numerous occasions where I was unhappy being there when I was smaller because I couldn't make my own choices, but in my junior to senior years in high school and when I was in college, I grew to appreciate public education. It was in these moments during my school years that eventually got me interested in studying art. Therapy is definitely helpful for LGBT plus youth to come to terms with their orientation and gender identity, as well as advice on how to navigate the world around them now that they know they're not like their peers. It is recommended for trans kids to seek counseling as soon as they begin to develop anxiety over their bodies and clothing not matching their identities, but no competent therapist and a primary care doctor will diagnose someone with gender dysphoria on the spot. They would first conduct a mental health evaluation, which can take multiple follow-up appointments to complete, but some members of the trans community understandably disagree with this because delaying treatment can worsen gender identity disorder in young patients. Meanwhile, they are progressing through puberty in accordance to their biological sex, and some of the natural changes they're going through cannot be reversible through gender-affirming care. That is why it is crucial for parents of transgender children to get them that help immediately. 
If you want to know more about how doctors check if puberty blockers are a necessary part of treatment for kids with gender dysphoria, check out Dr. Mike's video on the science and controversy of transgender healthcare where he does a podcast with psychiatrist Dr. Jack Turbin. There is a section on specifically treating children with that condition, especially those on the autism spectrum, and the guidelines on when to give them puberty blockers that I watched in preparation for this video that was well thought out and put opposing viewpoints into consideration. They used the knowledge they were taught in the medical training to discuss them. The part where Dr. Turbin addressed the side effects of puberty blockers stood out to me, mainly because Christine Rebstock kept making the argument that kids are too young to be put on that medication, when in reality, endocrinologists can consider recommending hormone replacement therapy to patients that are 13 and a half on a case-by-case -case basis to protect their bone density and save them from the stress of starting puberty later than their peers. At the end of that section in the video, Dr. Turbin stated that bans on gender-affirming care have not originated from the medical field, but rather from a right-leaning chiropractor that tried to introduce a bill that would have outlawed medical intervention for trans children. Anyway, Dr. Turbin wrote an op-ed about this bill for the New York Times that I'll put a link to in the description. He intended to sound the alarm that this is what was going on and that the wording used was worrying. He didn't think too much about it after that until we went on that podcast, but in retrospect, he should have been because we now have groups like Connecticut Valley Views, Moms for Liberty, and LGBTS United using the same kind of language to scare people into supporting these restrictions. It was a breath of fresh air to listen to Dr. Turbin and Dr. Mike have that conversation without giving in to the moral panic and agreeing with misinformation that had sold because of that. I cannot recommend their video on the subject more if there are any parents of gender-confused youth watching this video that are looking for advice on how to do the right thing. Let's avoid medical transition till they're maybe at least 16 to start HRT, but no blockers, no surgeries at all until their legal age and you have a confirmation of the diagnosis of gender dysphoria. So you would say 18? Would that be the For right? For surgeries, we, yes, <laughs> we had a group meeting at LGBTS United. We're like, we, we're kind of, we're okay maybe with HRT at 16, the current standards 14, 14 is too young. Mm -hmm. And no puberty blockers. We're seeing what the UK recently, um, decided uh, they're not going to administer them to kids. And that's been a trend in, in the European countries. Mm -hmm. But yet here, hey, we're all for it, right? That's our, our government is for it. And we have an attorney general that's all for hiding uh, kids when they express their gender identity is different than what they were born with. They could hide that, from, they encourage the schools to hide that from the parents. Yeah. Christine's arguments and whatever discussions she's been having with LGBTS United are redundant. Age restrictions laid out by guidelines on gender-affirming care are already in place. Surgeons won't provide top surgery for patients under 16, and they must be 18 before they be given bottom surgery, but exceptions can be made in cases involving severe gender dysphoria. As a general rule, medical professionals that specialize in gender-affirming care require parental consent before any operation can begin and any medication can be prescribed. I do believe that parents need to be kept informed on the treatment their transgender children are receiving so they can guide them and be supportive to the best of their abilities. It is a crucial element for transitioning since patients with supportive parents are more likely to be happier with themselves. Their mental health will improve as well because an accepting family and community means they won't feel bad about themselves. As a high school student and last year when I made my first video about Connecticut Valley Views, I watched a documentary about a girl named Josie that was born male and had a difficult childhood because neither her gender nor body matched. Her parents, particularly her mother, were initially surprised. They were having a hard time accepting that they didn't have the son they wanted, but I was incredibly happy that they decided to be supportive and guide her if that's what it took to help her feel alright. When a journalist asked Josie how old she was when she first realized she was born in the wrong body, she answered that she always knew and from an adult perspective, it convinced me that it's better for sex education to be included in the curriculum sooner rather than later. When you were little, did you feel like you were trapped in the wrong body? Yeah. How old do you think you were when you started feeling like that? 
when I started to know? Yeah. Always, I always knew. I had to put all my feelings aside to embrace my daughter. What I remember is my dad giving me thumbs up and I felt like I was going to cry. I was so happy. I felt proud of myself that I turned into a girl. It doesn't matter what they say. They can do whatever they want. I'm just going to do what I think is right. Christine's comment that schools are hiding their students' gender identities from their parents with the attorney general support is something that troubles me. Agreeing with her and deciding to out trans children would violate the HIPAA privacy rule. While it does not circumvent state laws where parents are allowed access to their child's medical records, which I again believe is necessary for gender-affirming care, doctors do have the right to revoke or block access if there is reason to suspect the child is a victim of domestic violence, abuse, and neglect. If Christine gets her way and wins her campaign for state representative, her promises will be an abusive parent's dream come true. It will be so much easier for them to control their child, and under parental rights laws, they can legally get away with it. A good friend of mine did tell me that someone placing parental rights above a child's welfare might be disingenuous, and I am rapidly starting to believe it to be true, because LGBTS United's Twitter page was heavily modified to make their support for Donald Trump clear as a bell. They've proudly declared their decision to endorse and vote for him in this tweet near the end of September. They can call me a deplorable for switching sides and voting for President Trump. They can even call me a MAGA all they want. I'd rather be all those things than a soulless, uncaring, degenerate any day of the week. May she reap the life she so richly deserves. The tweet linked in that post has since been deleted. However, LGBTS's united statement that they'd rather support Trump than be a soulless, uncaring degenerate contains a great deal of irony because they have been vocally anti-trans and Islamophobic on Twitter. It's no exaggeration. They recently quote tweeted a post from Libs of TikTok that attacked Tim Walls over a family-friendly pride event that was held in Minnesota. Here's the tweet in full. Tomorrow, Minnesota is holding a pride event called Day of the Transgender Child to celebrate trans kids with Dry Queen Story Hour, performances by trans artists, and a resource fair. Reminder that Minnesota Governor Tim Walls passed a law that takes children away from parents if they refuse to do sex change surgeries on their kids. Yes, that's because Minnesota is a state that's well within its right to intervene when a transgender child tells someone that they don't feel safe at home. What of it? LGBTS United has also started to consistently promote hate speech toward hidden immigrants in wake of Trump's xenophobic lies about them during his first debate with Kamala Harris. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country. Both Trump and his running mate, J.D. Vance, admitted afterwards that they have no evidence to support that claim, but the damage has already been done. Their lying has led to a rise of racially motivated attacks toward the Hayden community in Springfield, Ohio, and public schools had received bomb threats within two consecutive days, causing them to evacuate. Being okay with promoting hate speech and slander toward marginalized groups and deliberately ignoring the consequences of these actions causes LGBTS United to come across as soulless and uncaring, so by stating they'd rather not be that, they're only kidding themselves. Judging from these comments, doctor-patient confidentiality protected by the HIPAA privacy rule will go straight into the garbage. I sound like a tape recorder at this point when I say that a handful of European countries and obviously the Middle East are deadly for transgender and non-binary individuals to live in, with the UK and Russia being two of the worst. The UK's former Prime Minister, Rashia Shunak, said in a conference that it's common sense that a man is a man and a woman is a woman, completely disregarding the fact that gender and biological sex are two different concepts and recklessly putting trans youth and adults at greater risk of harassment. To add salt in the wound, he was filmed mocking the trans community. Former Health Secretary Steve Barkley had similarly proposed a law that would exclude trans women from female hospital wards even though a study from the year before found that nobody complained about it. 
It's both unethical and baseless to use dehumanizing legislation in other countries to validate arguments to impose restrictions on trans and gender non-conforming kids, getting the support from doctors that they need since a cluster of politicians in these countries are prejudiced against the LGBT plus community. Then the rest of the interview covers Christine citing an article from a Connecticut-based right-wing propaganda news outlet to vocalize her disgust toward a family-friendly pride event in stores that was allegedly funded by the state. She later discusses a time when she went bellyaching to the ACLU about wanting to ban trans girls from competing in sports in Connecticut and having heard nothing from them. It doesn't take a detective to figure out why that is. She reiterates her disdain toward DEI, her belief that gender-affirming care isn't a real term, and Susan agreeing that teenagers shouldn't be allowed to use social media whatsoever when there are plenty of constructive options for teaching them how to make smart decisions online. She and Christine, by contrast, have used fear-mongering throughout the interview to frighten viewers into supporting the restriction and eventual banning of books that cover gender issues, sexuality, and critical race theory in public schools. It's not going to stop kids from being gay, transgender, or non-binary. It'll only send them a message that they're not welcome in their own communities, and without that support, the impact on their mental health will be devastating. Hold that thought. I want to touch on the Pride event in stores briefly before I go since I signed a petition that opposed a ban on drag queen performances in Tennessee. I found out later a federal judge blocked it from being signed into law. Oh, thank God. All right. Now, next uh, June. June's coming up, and uh, that's June Pride Month. I guess they're going to have a lot of events. Uh, and you refer to the sponsors of these venues as the... Rainbow Mafia, that was your proprietary, excuse me, term for them. Is that right? The Rainbow Mafia, yes. <laughs> the LGBTQ plus, IA, whatever, whatever letters and numbers they're up to today. Well, you know, just a saw story in Connecticut Sentinel last night that uh, Mansfield Pride is going to, on June 7th, have an event okay. at downtown stores. But they're going to have a drag queen story hour for kids at but what seven o'clock at night and this is a um grant state funded grant that's being paid for this event mm -hmm. so we the people are paying for kids to be indoctrinated you know i don't hate drag queens trust me i've been to drag shows they're for adults mm -hmm. pride festivals are for adults parents leave the kids home yeah. that's all and, and two lgbts united we feel that only government flags, signs, murals should be displayed on government property or government funded property, which includes uh, that pride color sidewalk in Main Street, Middletown should be paved over, as well as the mural, the Biela mural on Trin Trinity Street next to the Kremlin on Capitol Avenue in Hartford, or a sign at Duncan Ballpark, that's a taxpayer funded park, or the BLM sign at Southern Connecticut State University. Drag Queen Story Hours have come under fire from the right wing since its inception. The first image that popped into my head years ago when I think of drag queens is a man in a dress with having makeup and looking stereotypically feminine, but it is a narrow-minded perspective that ignores why people that dress in drag enjoy it and do it as a livelihood. Some may dress in drag to challenge gender stereotypes, while others like Colton Hines when he dressed up like Marge Simpson for Halloween wear drag to cosplay their favorite characters. A few like a couple of friends of mine do it or used to do it because it's fun and it allows them to feel comfortable in their own skin. Drag story hours exist to encourage kids to be brave enough to embrace the qualities about themselves that make them different. They get them riled up to learn how to read and feel seen in the books they love. It is well known that reading helps kids and even adults build empathy by allowing them to connect with other people on a personal level and it puts their imagination to good use. Though my go-to genre of books are graphic novels, whenever I read chapter books like Harry Potter and a series of unfortunate events, my mind begins to function as a movie as I look at the text. I visualize scenes as they happen and I can piece together what a character could look like just by reading about what they were wearing and how I believe their voices sounded. Story hours play a critical role in improving a child's language skills and nurturing their imaginations, but dry queens reading stories to children enriches the experience by introducing them to unique narratives and get them interested in creative writing. 
It might be weird for me to admit, but Captain Underpants was an obnoxiously hilarious banned book series that got me to want to be a writer as a little kid. It eventually got me into developing an ongoing dark fantasy video game series. It caters to audiences ages 16 and older, but it covers issues that encourages critical thinking and introduces them to mixed media. Christine's added suggestion that only government flags should be displayed at government buildings seems fascist to me. I'm aware that this decision is up to individual jurisdictions such as the city governments, but prohibiting them from having the choice to reach out to the LGBT plus community definitely seems nationalist to say the least. It's the same with abortion rights. Not allowing women to have the choice to terminate their pregnancies nor allow them access to reproductive health care is suffocating and potentially life-threatening. My personal theory regarding why the Prada Vet and stores were state-funded is because drag is recognized by performers and audiences alike as an art form, and I believe the state wanted to support that to remind its LGBT plus population that they always have a home in Connecticut. I checked the page on Manfield's website that contained a list of Pride events to take a closer look, and they were all free for the public to attend. There were similar events that took place statewide last June, but they were funded by the towns and nonprofit causes advocating for LGBT plus rights. At the bottom of this page is a list of LGBT plus inclusive book recommendations that are categorized by age group. That's actually resourceful to bring up because not every child and grown-up can afford a trip to Barnes & Noble, and it's a huge reason why it's essential to keep libraries open. Okay, here I am on this page that's still active on Mansfield City website. Let's have a look around. June is LGBTQIA2S Plus Pride Month in Mansfield. Join the town of Mansfield in celebrating and supporting our LGBTQIA2S plus friends and neighbors this June. That's actually really sweet. They had a pride flag raising ceremony and the day after that on Memorial Day, free flags were available to pick up at essential businesses. That was kind of them. I like that. Here's an event that looked exciting. Join the town of Mansfield at Celebrate Pride. Learn about local LGBTQIA2S plus organizations and support. Snap a pic at our selfie stations. Pick up a free pride flag and pronoun pin and enjoy music in a strut your stuff dance off. Cool. You are also welcome to customize and tie dye your pride t-shirts suggested donation of $10 per shirt and the Yukon Dairy Bar ice cream truck will have sweet treats available for purchase. Yummy! The fun begins at 7 p.m. on Betsy Peterson Square in downtown stores. Don't miss the Dry Queen Story Hour at 8 p.m. The evening caps off with a screening of the movie Prom at Dark. Celebrate Pride is free and open to all ages to attend. These are wholesome activities that kids actually enjoy. This event's just as enjoyable. Cookies and a movie. Kids love cookies. I should know. I was once a kid, and I still love cookies to this day. Better yet, I am young at heart. And here's the reading list at the bottom of this page. It's a shame that Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe is not on this list. I love that book. These are still nifty recommendations. Christine can say all she wants that she's not against drag queens nor that she hate transgender children, but if you're claiming that any other story hour is acceptable while claiming that a family-oriented pride event that promotes a positive learning environment is something that should be illegal, it's not that the towns are indoctrinating and confusing kids, you just hate drag queens. I don't mean it as a personal attack, it's just that politicians that have made that argument are from states where LGBT plus youth, minority groups, and the disabled aren't treated as human. 
I'm not a doctor, like I said, but I believe that Christine Rebstock is dealing with unresolved trauma that may be caused by her upbringing in the 70s and being surrounded by unsupportive people much of her life. She seems to be an incredibly miserable person and heavily resistant to change to be treating her fellow members of the LGBT plus community the way she does in her guest appearances. To effectively fight the sexual exploitation of children, sex education and resources to assist LGBT plus youth must be kept in schools. If they learn through a step-by-step -step process that their feelings are nothing to be ashamed of and it's okay for them to ask questions about their changing bodies, they'll learn to effectively recognize abusive behavior from authority figures. You guys can let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you're still deciding who you're voting for in this year's presidential election, I hope this video has given you a reason to do your research and choose carefully. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll hopefully be back with a more cheerful attitude. I'll see you next time. Bye. Go, go, go.